194. Today we're going to be covering the Baroque time period, which existed or lasted approximately from 1600 to 1750. Um, the Baroque period is also known as the Age of Absolutism, which means that the, the owners or the rulers of the lands, the separate lands, the castles, uh, all the people that lived on their land, the dukes, the princes, the kings, uh, they all had absolute power. If they didn't like the color of shoes you're wearing, <clears throat> throw you in jail. Uh, here's an example. This is on page 119. By the way, uh, you can go, you can either pause the video and get your book out now, or go back and look at these pictures and stuff we're going to share later. But on page 119, I'm reading in the bottom paragraph on the far right side. The Baroque period is also known as the Age of Absolutism because many rulers exercise absolute power over their subjects. In Germany, for example, the Duke of Weimar could throw his court musician, Johann Sebastian Bach, into jail for a full month because Bach stubbornly asked to leave his job. I believe I mentioned this once before, but the reason it's absolute power is because nobody was over the Duke. He could do whatever he wanted. Breaking any laws. Nobody could touch him. He had absolute power. Okay, moving right along. Uh, in the Baroque period, they started uh, in the arts and stuff, becoming more extravagant, more flamboyant. Um, and a good example of this, if you look at the picture on page 119, and have page 95 ready also. On page 119, you'll notice the picture on the left. You got two women uh, brutally executing a man, and this is uh, dark, but it's showing action. It's showing action, and the colors are very contrasting. Notice how they use black in the background to bring out the uh, contrasting colors in the picture itself. If they used a different background, those colors wouldn't stand out so much. Now flip over to page 95. Remember the picture of Mother Teresa and the baby Jesus? Well, look, we do have a black background, but the colors are more subdued and blending toward each other. And Mary and Jesus are just standing there. Whereas the picture in the Baroque period, they start putting in action and storytelling stuff in their arts. So, all right, back on page 119, there's a statue of David. And in this statue of David, he's got his clothes on and he's got the sling and he's getting ready to sling it at Goliath. Back on page 95, there's the statue of David in all his glory, but it's just standing there. You don't even see a sling. And uh, so that was, remember, we talked about uh, discovery or rediscovery of, of humanism, uh, of the human form, human body. Well, on page 119, now we're telling stories and showing action in our arts and stuff. And music also became much more melodically active. Moving right along. On page 122, this is really kind of cool. Um, record players, <laughs> you know, the, the brown black things you put on a turntable and they, they play music. Record players, uh, well, I'll just read for you on page 122. In the music, the Baroque style flourished during the periods from 1600 to 1750. The two giants of Baroque composition were George Frederick Handel and Johann Sebastian Bach. Okay, so the two biggest composers were Handel and Bach. And later on years, we knew very little about other composers during that time period because we didn't 
travel over there and hear them. Uh, there's no no uh, audio recordings. Here we go. Box of death in 1750 marks the end of the period. Other Baroque masters, men very good composers, were Claudio Monteverdi, Henry Purcell, Arcangelo Corelli, and Antonio Vivaldi. And nobody really knew much about them until the 20th century. Okay, almost 200 years later. And this is why we now know about them. The appearance of long playing records in the late 1940s spurred a Baroque revival that made these musicians familiar to many music lovers. In other words, they were recorded over in their homelands and now records were coming over here and people rediscovered these uh, other composers. So the big uh, win on your test when we're talking about the social aspects of uh, the Baroque period. The record player created in 1940, not during the Baroque period, but in the 20th century, let us know more about the Baroque composers because of the records being able to be shipped and uh, people in different lands hearing them. Music is now, oh yeah, instrumental music is now uh, just as important as vocal music. Remember, uh, during the Renaissance, vocal music was the main focus. In fact, all the pieces we listened to were uh, vocal musics, musics, music pieces. All right, now let's talk about the characteristics, the characteristics of the general characteristics of the music during the Baroque period. The mood of the music was exp expressed from the beginning to the end. In other words, if it was a sad song at the beginning, it stayed sad all the way to the end. If it were happy, it would be happy from the beginning to the end. If it were fast at the beginning, it would be fast all the way to the end. The, so the mood of the music goes from is all the way through. The rhythm set the mood with rhythmic patterns that continue throughout the piece. Pretty much combined with what I just said about mood, that's why I did not write mood up here, but the rhythm is what determined the mood. That rhythm right there at the beginning would be a nice, snappy, kind of happy rhythm. And it, like I said, it would start at the beginning of the piece and you would hear it during the piece from the beginning to the end. Uh, this rhythm. is nice and slow and really kind of sad. You don't feel real happy because you're having to hold yourself back and slow down for it. So the, the rhythm set the mood from the beginning to the end. Now the melody, the first phrase is repeated from the beginning of the piece to the end of the piece. Uh, for instance, <clears throat> come back later on, you'd have that melody to begin with. And then the piece would carry on. Yeah, more.
more music, more music, more music, more music, and then somewhere else, da da da, it comes back. And what that does is when your brain hears what you heard at the very beginning, later on in the middle of the piece, you go, oh, I recognize this. So it, it gives continuity throughout the piece. The dynamics, terraced, T-E-R-R-A-C-E-D. And this is one of the favorite, my favorite things to teach uh, in person. I've never done it in front of a camera. I don't know it's gonna be that much fun. But remember, at the end of the Renaissance, we had the Venetian school of music. Uh, it was not a brick and mortar school, but just a group of people. And they increased the ability to have louder dynamics. So instead of just going from soft to a little loud, soft to a little loud, they now can go soft to a little loud, to a little louder, to a little louder. They can just get louder and louder and louder. And the type of terror, uh, dynamics they did were called terrorist dynamics, not terrorists, but terrorists. Think of you own a piece of land, and it's a big hill. And you're a farmer, and you want to grow crops. So you grow crops. Uh-oh, you can't farm this. Because if you had a tractor, it'd fall way down the hill. Couldn't work. So what farmers did is they would come through and they would start here and they would cut that chunk of the hill out. Then they would cut this chunk of the hill out. Then they would cut this chunk of the hill out. And now you have a whole lot more surface area and can grow more crops. This is called terraced farming. A terrace, if you go to a uh, 10 story high hotel or motel, I think hotel has multiple stories. Anyhow, and, and you open up the door and you step out on a balcony, it's also known as a terrace. It's like a, a porch, a flat porch, and this is called terrace farming. Now here's what's interesting is you, you're, you're farming this land right here. Well, let's go ahead and add, you probably have some more down here. So you farm here, you don't gradually go up. You go up here, farm here, jump way up the next level, farm here, jump way up here. So it's a sudden difference in the height of where the land is. Same thing with music. Let's say we're going to do this backwards. You begin the song soft, Begin the song soft for the first couple uh, phrases. And then you would jump all the way to loud. You wouldn't go soft and gradually getting louder. You would, you would just be soft and then all of a sudden, you're loud. So it goes from here to here, from soft to loud. It didn't go all the way in the middle, all the way up. Just sudden, sudden changes. That's terrace dynamics. <clears throat> the texture of the piece is mostly polyphonic, which you already know what poly means. Uh, multiple melodies. Do, 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 do. And then the chords, oh, this is cool. I, I like this part. The chords, it, the, the style was called basso continuo. And what that means, the bass part, the harmonies and all that down in the bass, supporting the melody, were the same throughout the piece. I'm going to play a piece of music for you now called Green Onions. Green 
Eight Onions is the title. The performer is Booker T. And the MGs. And we're using this, listen to it as an example of Basso Continuo. I will have a link to Booker T and the, and the MGs uh, in this class assignment. Um, I'm not going to show it. I'm just going to let you listen to this. But the one, the link that I'm using today, it just has music, no video. But if you go back and watch the video, the bass player, he looks so bored. He does the same thing throughout the entire song. You'll hear it. In fact, that's what I started class with today. Let me see if it's ready to rock. No, I have to turn the uh, sound bar back on. It goes off after six minutes. Let's see. Here we go. Here's the bass part. Bum, bum, ba, bum, 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 ba, bum. than just sitting there listening to a song and looking at a board. Uh, in fact, if you got grandma or grandpa around, bring them in. I bet they remember that song. They really like it. And that is a, uh, I'm not sure when they did that, 70s maybe? But um, yeah, say I use a modern piece of music to demonstrate an old musical style, the basso continuo. All right, the orchestra. Remember when I talked to you about Bach being the court musician and on Saturday nights the Duke or the Prince would bring all, their, all his friends, they'd sit around and listen to like you know 10 people playing uh, a piece and that's not very loud. Well now the orchestra has jumped and used as many as 40 musicians. So what can you do with the volume? Remember the terrace dynamics? 10 instruments playing, then all of a sudden 40 are playing. It's going to be four times louder all of a sudden. Uh, trumpet players, this is kind of an interesting thing. Back in the day, whenever countries went to battle, the group, the first group up front was the band, a marching band. And... Um, Anyhow, they could get captured also, and when they did, this is this is pretty interesting. Uh, page 125, second paragraph. The Baroque trumpet, like the early French horn, had no vowels, but was given rapid, complex, melodic lines to play really high notes. Because the instrument was difficult to play and had a traditional association with royalty, a connection to you know, kings and dukes, the trumpeter was the aristocrat of the Baroque orchestra. In other words, the trumpet, if you played trumpet, you were like a rock star. When prisoners of war were exchanged, Trumpeters or trumpet players, if they had been captured, were treated like military officers. In other words, uh, the prisoners are released and they come home, and here come the generals and colonels and the trumpet players. And there's crowds just cheering and screaming. And then 
getting off the boat or however they were transported. Here comes all the uh, clarinet and tuba and drummers and all the privates from the army and they were just like scum. Nobody really cared that they were there. But trumpet players were treated like superstars. Okay. Oh, here's, here's cool. I will show this video on uh, the computer tone color. Tone color, also known as timber, or timbre, excuse me, timbre, and not timber, uh, is different instruments sound different from each other. A trumpet, a piccolo, a flute. If you hear a flute, you know, really high, and then you hear a tuba, there's a difference in the way they sound. And composers started writing their music specifically for certain instruments because when you blend the sounds they have to make a different tone color altogether. Uh, this was just being experimented with during the Baroque Orchestra. It's not by any means uh, the most important part of the piece. Still the rhythm and the mood and the melody and, and the harmonies, the polyphony, that was the main fo focus, not tone color. But it's starting out to be discovered here I'm going to play a video here about tone color, and yes, I'm going to turn the camera so that you can see it. I will also add the link to the class page. Now let's tilt this like here, like so. And we will listen to the video about tone color. And I show the video because it makes it so much easier to understand, especially with me doing a video. It's 1963, and one of the highest rated TV shows, The Andy Can't Band. hear that, can you? Let's raise that volume. Plays a tune called Dueling Banjos. This now famous tune is often played. All right, we'll start over. It's 1963, and one of the highest rated TV shows, The Andy Griffith Show, features an episode where a bluegrass band plays a tune called Dueling Banjos. This now famous tune is often played with just a banjo and a guitar, since that's the way it was heard in the 1972 film Deliverance. Let's hear part of the opening of that tune. Did you hear that? A banjo played a short melodic idea, then a guitar repeated it back, note for note. But why did the banjo sound so different from the guitar? After all, aren't they both string instruments playing identical notes at relatively the same volume? The reason their sounds are different is due to something we call tone color, or timbre. Part of getting the most out of listening to music involves being able to hear subtle differences in timbre, as well as being able to correctly identify voices and instruments by their tone color. Please note that tone color and timbre mean the same thing, and that timbre is pronounced timbre. It is interesting that we use the word tone color when describing the unique quality of an instrument or voice, because if you think of the different instruments of the orchestra as having unique colors, it helps you understand the art of orchestration. If each instrument has a unique color, then one can achieve even more colors by blending and mixing them, just like a painter does. You can also highlight some colors by putting them next to a contrasting color. So if a composer wants a trumpet part to really stand out, he or she may have the strings play the harmony while the trumpet plays, instead of doing the same using other brass instruments. In music, composers and arrangers often take great care when assigning certain instruments to different melodic, rhythmic, and harmonic parts. As a final illustration of tone color, I will use a piece of music I composed for a student film where I wrote parts for the violin, trumpet, and trombone. I couldn't decide if I wanted a violin or a trumpet to play the melody in the opening, so I recorded both. Here's the violin performing the melody.
And here's the trumpet version. Notice how each instrument was playing the same passage, but their tone colors were different. I have taken the liberty to mix these two recordings together to illustrate how mixing these two tone colors produces its own unique timbre. Tone color plays a very important role when the music is trying to evoke specific ideas or events or used to accompany a play, a film, or a video game. If you're feeling especially tense during a scene in a horror film, chances are the film composer chose very appropriate tone colors to create such a mood. This explains why orchestras are still used today in such roles. The orchestra has been and continues to be a favorite medium for composers to express their musical ideas. Part of that reason is that the orchestra is capable of producing an almost unlimited range of tone colors, and it does it with the highest fidelity. As you listen to complex works such as symphonies and operas, pay special attention to how masterful composers utilize the many different tone colors of voices and instruments to paint us interesting pictures. Be sure to like and subscribe for more music-related videos, and as always, thanks for watching. As always, thanks for watching. What did I click on there? That's not going to play, is it? Okay, cool. All right, now let's get back to a little bit of class and discussion here. There we go. We got a, a glare, I see, on the video. I mean, on the screen. Let's, what if I tilt it a little? All right. Well, I'll just deal with the glare for now, and on the next video, I will have that taken care of somehow. Not sure how, but I will. Give me something to work on. All right, let's talk about form. Remember, we had the motet, the style had its own form, the magical had its own form, and so did the mass. <clears throat> well, the form that was pro predominantly very popular <clears throat> in the Baroque period is a sweep. <clears throat> sweep is made up of three movements. You have the first movement, then the second movement, and the third movement. Now remember we learned about movements. A movement is a piece of music that can stand alone. In other words, you can hear it on a concert all by itself. But it is part of a larger piece. So you can go to a concert and hear just the second movement of Frank Sinatra's Suite in A minor. Or you can hear just the first and the third, depending on the performing musician. Now, their form was decided between the first movement would be fast usually, second movement slow, and the third movement would be fast. What do you think the form label would be? Yes, you got it. A, B, A. So on your test, when, I, when, when uh, you're talking about the general music characteristics, they, they wrote a lot of suites which used A, B, A form. I know this sounds uh, a little bit, this is a short video, but the next part's going to be a whole class on its own. So I'm going to stop right there. This is basically the introduction to the Baroque period, talk about society, <coughs> the absolute power, and how things were done, the record player, and the changes in the art where it shows action. <laughs> Beep, beep. And uh, so your assignment for the next class period to be turned in before the next class period begins is to write a short synopsis of this introduction to the Baroque period. Next time when we return, we will talk about uh, Johann Schabach and his 
a uh, little fugue in G minor, and so if you feel froggy and want to get a heads up on it, go check that out. Again, I'm going to add the uh, video links uh, to the class page in Moodle, and um, I reckon that's it. Y'all have a wonderful day.